Okay, so now, just very, um, just I just want to end by discussing Palestinian counter cartography a bit. Um, I was really interested, like I said, when I started this project, in how the Palestinian uh, leadership did not have maps in Oslo. They were signing Israeli maps, and this is something that Edward Said was very upset about. Uh, like, why don't you have any maps? You know. <laughs> Um, but now Palestinians, the leadership, and a lot of people not involved with the PA, have excellent maps. Now you can't really talk about the conflict without resorting to many maps. So now there's many maps. So I wanted to ask those two questions. One, what did it mean that the Palestinians didn't have maps? How were they thinking of Palestine? It must have been different from how modern sensibilities think about territory. And then also, what is it doing to the way we think about the conflict that we have all of these maps and that the map is so important in the negotiations? Often, it's the only thing that's going to solve it, according to the leadership. Give me the border. It's going to solve Jerusalem. It's going to solve settlement. It's going to solve water. It's not going to solve the refugees. They don't have a map for that. <clears throat> this is a PLO poster, early PLO poster, 1964. And when we say that Palestinians didn't make maps, it's not really true. They didn't, they weren't cartographers, like scientifically measuring, yeah? But they were using the map. And you see the map in many posters and logos. So this is a PLO poster, 1964. Um, and not only does it have the map, but it also has symbols of struggle, yeah? And not only does it have symbols of revolutionary struggle, it has women and it has children. Where So, so much of the struggle back then was a popular struggle. It wasn't, it wasn't about give me the border and it will fix everything. It was about liberation. Where everybody was involved, not just the technocrats, not just the leadership, it was everybody. And you see it too in Fatah and the um, Jibhaz logos where there's maps in both, and the top in Fatah's logo, the map is there, but it's also it's in the background. It's not the, it's not the most important thing. The most important thing, or what's in the foreground, what's more prominent, is struggle, armed struggle. This is the rise of the Fedaini. And then, of course, with the Popular Front, the map is there, but what's prominent about it is the arrow returning. It's the return. You all know, you know that Arafat used to wear his kafiyah like that because it was a map of Palestine, huh? Unbelievable. This is, uh, <laughs> I read in one of his biographies that he used to spend one hour every morning making it a map of Palestine. I don't know if that's true, but this is right. It is real. Yeah? It's, it's real? He spent one hour? No, it's busy. Two hours for the makeup. <laughs> This is a cartoon, um, it's obviously Zionist, you have Netanya and Tel Aviv on there, um, showing just what a threat Arafat is, because he has the entire map of Palestine that he wears. He's not a peacemaker, he wants everything, you know? Um, but it's also a really nice illustration to show side by side. Snow. Yeah. <laughs> this is in the 1980s. According to the person who made this map, his name is Khalid Tufakci, he's in Jerusalem. According to him, this was the first time Palestinians made a map of Palestine. Or Palestinian cartographers, let's say, made a map of Palestine. And what's interesting about it is if you read the legend, I zoomed in, here's the legend. It's, first of all, all of Palestine, first of all. Second, it also, it ha it's, it's very focused on, on people in that it's focused on the villages. The villages before Israel, the villages after the abandoned ones. Or, but also the Jewish areas, which he refers to as settlements. He doesn't call them towns. They're cities. They're settlements. So it's still, they're colonizers according to this map. <coughs> and this map took him uh, and his team five years to make. They actually went throughout the whole country and surveyed where the villages were. They started in 1983, and they finished it in 1988. 
And what's interesting about 1988 was that that was also the year that the Palestinian leadership uh, declared independence on a two-state solution. So I asked him, I asked Khalid Tufekci, who, is, who makes maps now for the, for the negotiations, largely on Jerusalem. He's very much a Jerusalem type of cartographer uh, or interested in Jerusalem. I asked him how the maps changed after 1988. And he said, yeah, we only map the West Bank and Gaza now. We don't map all of Palestine. It's much easier. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, is a, it is a lot easier, you're right. Um, <clears throat> any questions on this? So now when we read about you know the negotiations, it's really just about Gaza and the West Bank. Um, like I mentioned before, that's an actual quote from Abu Mazen. Give me the border, it's going to solve. I told you if you gave me the border, it was going to solve Jerusalem settlements and water. Um, but the refugees don't fit anywhere. So for me, in this project, in, I thought it was just fascinating that the refugees didn't fit anywhere. Because for me, what that means is that because the refugees are not giving up the right of return, they're going to force us, or potentially can force us, to think about Palestine in a different way. <clears throat> but for now, in the negotiations, it's all about land swaps and territory percentages. Mm -hmm. If you read the Palestine papers, the question of percentages, this is really just the negotiations. First of all, what the starting point is. For the Israelis, well, for the Palestinians, the starting point is the Green Line, 1967 borders. For the Israelis, the starting point is the facts on the ground, meaning the settlements, mm -hmm. that are growing every day, so you don't really have a line anyway. So they can't agree on that starting point. Uh, but they do agree on territorial swaps. This is from the Negotiations Affairs Department website. They, there's this myth about how Arafat <coughs> uh, refused a very generous offer at, uh, at Taba, or at Camp David, <coughs> at Taba. And um, there weren't any maps that were made public there. And in fact, before Taba at Camp David, the Palestinians refused, they had really great maps. They refused to exchange maps with the Israelis until the Israelis agreed that they would start at 1967. Bill Clinton was there. He starts yelling at the Palestinians. I told you, I'm the president of the United States. You're going to do what I say, that kind of stuff. Um, but they refused to switch maps, to exchange maps. At Taba, they did have maps, but nothing was really made public. So the myth of Arafat turned down a really generous offer. No one really knew what the offer was, you know? So the Negotiation Affairs Department come, came up with, with this about how Israel wanted to continue um, occupying the area of where the aerial settlement is now and all of Jerusalem, of course. Um, so then they come back with their counter map. Well, if we were to do that to Israel, would it be acceptable? No, no. But then they end time to talk. Let's keep talking, you know. <laughs> yeah, but the good thing that there's no problem in Gaza Strip. Yeah, no one. It's, it's the same. <laughs> they they <laughs> both agree yeah. about Gaza. Yeah, it's <laughs> Something really interesting too in my research was how refugees make maps. Now this is from Google Earth. Uh, when Google Earth first came out in uh, 2005, 2006, there was uh, something called the Nakba layer. Now, the way Google Earth works is anybody in the world can make little pins on Google Earth and share it with people, and Google has nothing to do with it. You share it. It's just like a, a base for your maps. Okay? It doesn't control what you make. But in the Google Earth community, there was this refugee. His name is Damien Darby. He's from Gen uh, he lives in Jenin. Uh, and he was very active as a Google Earth uh, person on the community message boards, and he made a Nakba layer. And Google, when it first came out, used to show best of Google Earth community. 
and because he was so popular in the Google Earth community, his layer got promoted. So when you would download Google Earth, it would give you best of like some samples of the best of the Google Earth community, and they had the Nakba layer there, and that upset Zionists to say the least because it had these dots all over what is Israel. And as you can see from the difference between this map, which the the PA, uh, this is their parameters, the refugees don't respect that. They're going to map however they want, you know. What's notable about that is that it caused such a huge firestorm online where uh, a lot of bloggers were saying, oh my god, the internet is a new battlefield and the Palestinians are winning, we need to do something about that. And now Israel has been trying to establish a presence on Wikipedia, like uh, asking people to volunteer or even paying people to change Wikipedia pages and to make comments on blogs. Like They're really taking it online. But the refugees kind of had a head, up, head start on that. They started at first. There was a town in, in uh, 48 that Sue, threatened to sue Google because of the Nakba layer. Um, so the refugee maps are much more of a threat to Zionists than the Palestinian authorities maps. You know? Because they don't respect, Israel can't control what they're mapping like they can control what goes on in the negotiations. <clears throat> Any questions and comments?